The following interview was conducted with Carol Barrett, uh, formerly retired from the Center for Career Opportunities, formerly the University Placement Office, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, February the 12th, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about your early years and your parents and siblings and where you were born. Oh, wow. And okay. K through 12. <laughs> well, I was born in Missouri, and when I was five, my folks moved from a very rural area of Missouri to Chicago. That was 1944, 45. And um, my dad taught high school, and in those years, teachers were making about 3000 a year. And so even in those years, we didn't have much money. But they were able to buy a house within a year, and I grew up in, in a suburb called Blue Island, which is south of Chicago, Chicago South Side. And um, went to a high school that was about 2,000 students, graduated with 500. And um, most of my classmates were going to the University of Illinois. And for some reason, I decided I wanted to go to a small school. I, I look back, and I'm not sure why. Maybe, maybe the, the size of my high school had something to do with it. But at any rate, I picked DePauw in Greencastle, Indiana. So that was How my, did you tell us how you picked? Did you go to visit it, or? I did. I went to visit it. But I think more importantly, in those days, we were Methodist. And DePauw was more closely aligned. It still is aligned with the Methodist Church, but more closely at that time. And I knew some people down there from prior high school graduating classes. So I did go visit and decided that's where I would go. Um, DePauw was, the first two years, a complete challenge to me. I graduated 26th in my high school class and thought that was pretty spiffy. And when I got down there, I discovered that there were all kinds of folks that had graduated as valedictorians and salutatorians of classes as big or bigger than mine, and I was a little fish in a big pond. So the first two years, I spent totally trying to crack the grade code, and um, in the process, figured it out, learned how to study, and I think, I know I'm making this for Purdue, but <laughs> I think that DePauw is kind of responsible for the rest of my life because it really did set me up to go ahead eventually and, and do graduate work and just just taught me a lot about how to study and how to get things done. Um, after I graduated from DePauw, I went back. What year did you tell us a little about campus life and did you live on campus and mm -hmm. any student organizations? And Well, DePauw at that time, and still is, uh, around 2,000 students, and very heavily Greek. So most students joined a fraternity or sorority, and I did, and I lived on campus. Campus was very small, as you can imagine, with 2,000 students, and Greencastle itself isn't very large. Um, <clears throat> so I lived in a house of about 65 women. Um, we didn't move into the sororities till we were sophomores. So um, I was involved in several activities. Frankly, I'm having trouble right at the moment remembering what it's they okay. were. Yeah. But most of my time was spent with studying. Okay. And that was not only because I needed to learn how to study, but most people, it was a very academic uh, environment. What was your major? My major, um, well, actually I had, I ended up with, with three major areas. One was education. One was uh, history, and that's what I taught in high school. And then one was psychology. Okay. So when I graduated from DePauw, I got a job at Revis High School, which is just south of O'Hare Airport, or I'm sorry, Midway Airport in Chicago. <clears throat> and I taught there, taught um, English my first two years in history, my next three. Um, Revis was a very large school. It was mainly blue-collar uh, community. Most of the people there were Eastern European, either first or second generation. And um, again, we graduated about 500 a year and very, very, very few. I can almost count on one hand 
the number of students who went on to any kind of education, let alone university. It's very much a terminal experience. I loved it. Um, did I loved you live it. close by there, or did you live in a community where it was? I, no, actually, I lived uh, up near Oak Brook, which is up more on the west side. Sure. Right. I commuted about 20 miles a day just to uh, teach. And um, in Illinois at that time, you had to upgrade your degree within a certain number of years. I had done a couple of years out at Boulder, Colorado, at the University of Colorado, a couple of summers. Um, but one, and I hate to admit this, I always was worried that a student in career services would ask me how I chose Purdue. But anyway, uh, one evening, um, a friend of mine from Revis called and, and said that another friend and her husband were going to come to Purdue because he had a job teaching here. And she said, I need to work on my master's, do you? And I said, yes. And she said, well, why don't we go down there with him? So that's how, so <laughs> that's how the decision was made. And um, Fellow students. Yeah. Friends were coming, and so we would we would come to. Um, so I came down here in '68, and my goal was to get my master's degree. And I was on a leave of absence from Revis, and I was going to go back and be the dean of girls. Well, one thing led to another, and um, I didn't want to leave Purdue. So I. Um, talked with my superintendent at Revis. He said, fine, not a problem. And so I stayed down here and started my PhD. At the same time, um, I, I became involved with the cooperative houses, and I was a live-in graduate assistant at Ann Twiddell, which I think is still in business somewhere on campus. And in that process, I got to know Betty Nelson very well and the rest of the Dean of Women's staff. At that time, the Dean's office was Dean of Women, Dean of Men. Okay. And um, so when an entry-level position became available there, I was offered that job and started working for the Dean of Women, um, trying to think, I guess it was 1970. Still working on the PhD. <laughs> Is it with Bev, Bev Stone or, or uh -huh. Sh Helen Schleeman? Was she be no? The Helen was retired. Okay. It was Bev and Barb Cook. But it was still the it was it now the dean of women. Uh -huh. oh, still, still the dean, dean of women. Of women. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I worked there uh, about three years. In the meantime, I did marry, and um, about a year after I was married, there was an, a job opening in uh, what was then called the University mm -hmm. Placement Service. The University Placement Service had been University Placement for Men until I believe 1968. Now Dick can tell you more about that because he was actually on the scene. Um, but in 68 I believe it became the University Placement Service. And one of the people who was on the staff at that time was going to leave and she had been uh, originally hired from the dean of girls' office or dean of women's office because she had helped women find jobs when mm -hmm. she was there. Yeah. So I let me just interject for the researchers that at that time for women for the placement there was a uh, uh, some materials housed in the dean of women's office right. for them for the women to but the men right. would go to the placement office for for men only. Right. right. Okay. And of course that sounds. To me, it probably won't to any of the younger folks, but it sounds to me like it's very recent, and in many ways it was. Uh -huh. Purdue was very late in coming to co-ed student services, co-ed academics. Um, at that time, a woman trying to get into some of our schools was usually not successful. We had a number of schools at that time uh, that people like Helen Schleeman and Bev Stone and Barb Cook and the little Carol Barretts of the world were trying to convince that women could be, be a XYZ or a, a ABC. So it was interesting times. Um, that same movement was going on in employment, by the way. Employers up until the 70s, let's say, were very reluctant to hire women into career path positions. 
And um, since Purdue attracted a lot of employers to campus to interview, uh, and a lot of those employers were very technically oriented, um, women were really, um, well, uh, it's no secret, they were discriminated against. It wasn't unusual for a woman to be asked in an interview, when do you plan to marry and have children? And depending on the answer, that woman was, was usually shuttled off to the side. Mm. So all of that was in play at the time that I interviewed for the, the job and, and got it. And I guess <clears throat> part of looking back to me is always to find the humor and things. But uh, my husband at that time, my ex-husband now, was very pleased that I was going to change jobs because I was going for a big increase. Um, Where I, was the PhD at that point? The PhD was still <laughs> in process. Didn't have it yet. Didn't have it yet. Um, but um, I remember him saying, you know, to several of our friends, while well, she was making ten thousand a year in the dean of girls' office, but or women's office, but now she's going to be making thirteen thousand. And that, and as we sit here in '08, sounds like a mighty small increase. Um, but at any rate, I did go over to university placement and originally was a counselor for women. Was that housed in Stewart Center? Uh-huh. Okay. It, it has been located. forever. Oh. It's been right where it is forever. Um, so I started my, my job um, mainly working with students, although we all worked with employers. And one of the things I think that's crucial in understanding the placement service, which eventually becomes career services, is it was a very large operation. Employers like Purdue Curriculum. They could hire many different kinds of technical people here, engineers, scientists. Um, they could hire managers, although the management school was relatively small at that time. Um, they could get a cross-section of agricultural majors if they needed those. And so this, this university has traditionally, and still does, attract a, a wide range of employers from all over the country and at, at times from all over the world. Um, so we were very, very high visible in terms of the national scope. Purdue was considered in the nation usually the top, in the top three of the number of interviews we ran. And um, there was a time, I think in the mid-80s, although as a history major, I'm not always clear on my dates, <laughs> um, when we actually ran 35,000 interviews during the interview season on campus. And that interview season was September, October, November, January, February, March. So it was a, it was a large operation, as long as the economy was good. The minute the economy starts to turn, college recruiting is one thing that employers tend to cut back on right away. And so it's a very cyclical business. It can be, it can cycle by major or it can cycle by the entire scope. And my guess is right now with the economy the way it is as we sit here in 08, they're starting to cycle down because there is a more or less across the board recession apparently either here or on the horizon, who knows. And I, my guess is employers are starting to, starting to pull back. Whenever the employers pull back, the students ramp up. So your two main clients are never in step. One is eager and the other is, well, um, you know, I may find, in the case of the student, when the economy is good, I'll find a job tomorrow. And the employers are, are out there beating the bushes for them. And when the economy is tight, like my guess is it will be in the next few months, um, students are eager. They're, they're right out there on the street looking for jobs, and employers are sitting back and saying, ho hum. Mm -hmm. So it was a, from the get-go, so to speak, it was a, a fascinating business because of the cyclical nature and the fact that when one client was in quote-unquote good shape, the other one usually was struggling a little bit. And sometimes that imbalance really stretches your resources as a university office. Um, universities are not renowned 
and Purdue certainly isn't renowned, for changing resources as needs change. Usually your office is set up, as you well know, um, kind of along the middle line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, just because your business changes drastically because the economy has done something different okay. yeah. doesn't mean you're going to get any more help, any less help, any more staff, any more money, et cetera. So through thick and thin, from 1973 to 2005, um, I and many of my office mates just p got in and pitched and pitched and pitched. Uh, that was one thing that was very unique, I think, about that staff. And my guess is that Dick won't tell you this because he's very modest. Maybe he will. I mean, he may prove me wrong. But the, um, the staff, in my memory, which is, I think, 34 years, if I added correctly, um, was always very dedicated. Uh, we had a very loyal group, a lot of this the people who were there in the 70s stayed until they retired or are still there. Uh, and they're good people. They're very talented people. They've been leaders in our professional associations nationally. Um, they've been leaders on campus. And they're very dedicated. And it's a good thing because mm -hmm. there, there have been times in my history when uh, a 40-hour week was a joy. Um, Weekends were not unusual, nights were not unusual ever. And um, a lot of that is just the crush of trying to get the student and the employer to meet in a good situation where they can begin to talk about how the future might be for the two of them. Lots of times, especially the last few years I worked, the graduate students that I um, supervised would tell me, you know, what would we do if the computer broke down? Because the computer has revolutionized that whole business. It hasn't made it less busy. <laughs> I don't think it has in any business. Right. But it's completely From a production changed. in it. Right. Yeah. It's right. completely changed it. And up until, I want to say about nine, the early 1980s, we were running the operation totally with paper, typewriter, a phone system with three lines in and no voicemail. Um, in fact, uh, every schedule was typed by hand. Every publicity notice was typed by hand on a typewriter. There was no computer. Um, and when the computer did come in, it could, took a lot of time for it to be adapted to the kinds of needs we had. So computerized, I would say somewhere in the mid-90s, we became completely mm -hmm. computerized, where students could put their resumes on the computer, they could sign up by computer, employers could work out their schedules by computer, and the schedules were produced by the computer. Neither one is good or bad. There's problems with both. but. Um, there were definite advantages to not being on the computer in that in those early years, I remember the relationships were much closer between our staff and students and our staff and employers. Um, and very frankly, in the last part of my career, I really missed that. Students used to have to line up, and I know you remember this. Oh, Lord, yes, yeah. I was going to ask you how the process has changed a lot. There used to be huge groups and huge lines. Uh, you know. By the way, I finished my Ph.D. in 78, oh, getting back to my Ph.D. <laughs> my major professor um, called me, I think, in 76, and he said, um, you know, you're going to be the longest Ph.D. student in this university if you don't hurry up and get this thing done. And I said, Dr. Klein, I have to tell you, I enjoy working more than I do research. And he said, but I have to tell you, Carol, that a PhD is based on research. <laughs> so I hurried up and got it done. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad I did. I don't think at the present time it would be as crucial in our business as it was when I got mine, because at, at a certain time in history, University administrations were very tilted toward the doctorate. I don't think they are that tilted anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Um, do you want me to go into the yeah, change go ahead. in operation? Yeah. Right, yes. Well, big as I groups, said, you, excuse me, big groups used to come, like GM uh, would come, and right. you know, I mean, en masse. Right. right, very big. Uh, it wasn't un unusual for IBM to bring 130 recruiters. Right, right. Part of that was the philosophy during those days of the employer. The employers in those days wanted to interview everybody. Um, they so had they jobs. A big contingent. Mm -hmm. They had jobs. They had real technical needs. A lot of very uh, important research, as we look back now, was going on in those days. And um, so they wanted to talk to everyone. It wasn't unusual for a pharmaceutical company to come in and say, we want to see all of your pharmacists and your chemical engineers, every last one that wants to talk to us. In the interim, that whole philosophy has changed. And now employers typically do what's called targeted employment. Unfortunately, and I'll talk more about this in a little while, but unfortunately that carries some some restrictions with it that really hurt students. Um, I've always been a firm believer in a late bloomer, because <laughs> right. I was, well, I guess that partially why. Um, but to me, the, the GPA says a lot, but it doesn't say everything. And that's one of the things that employers have been targeting on for a couple of decades now. They only want to talk to people with a, you know, a B or a B plus average and above. They don't want any, any Cs on the record. Da, 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 da. And whereas they used to look at progression up, they now just look at that number. And to me, I think they're missing a lot of talent. A lot of people who just didn't develop their interests until they were perhaps a junior in college or didn't, like, like I didn't, know how to study in a university. Um, they're just late bloomers and they have a lot of potential and I think a lot of our employers have, have suffered as a result. Sometimes it's, it's more of a legitimate thing in a way because they don't need to hire very many people and so cost effective wise they don't want to see very many people. But still I would argue against it. I think it's kind of artificial. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to get horse here. Going back to the computer for a minute. Prior to the computer and voicemail and all these technical things, um, the uh, typical way an employer would contact us was by phone or by snail mail. And uh, we would set up a date for them and talk with them about what kinds of jobs they had and, and what kind of majors they wanted to see. And from that information, we would generate publicity again on the typewriter um, and students knew that that publicity for that employer's visit would go out three weeks ahead of the employer's visit. The publicity was found two places in our office and in their academic unit. Most of them would come over here for some reason to see the publicity and they were little blue sheets about that big and we had and still have a very small office and so these notices as we call them were hung inside the office when I first arrived um, and they were kind of bundles so that if you were looking at General Motors or IBM or a large company with many recruiters you might have ten different notices and you would have to look at each one to see what kind of job they looking. had available and what kind of majors they were looking for. Um, these were behind some slanted bookcases and so those students who were shorter couldn't get to the top. So the common thing that most students carried if they were vertically challenged to placement was a yardstick and they would stand down on the floor and they would take this yardstick <laughs> and there would be hundreds of them in that office trying to view these notices. Oh my lord. Oh, it was it was real it was it was very challenging and when we were going through it we thought, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But at the same time the staff worked those crowds. They asked us for help. And so we knew our students. Um, there was a lot of one on one and interaction. A lot of one on one. <clears throat> a lot of students who would say 
as they were trying to see a notice, you know, I'm just not finding what I want. And so we could suggest things to them. Um, or we would say, come in, make an appointment, come in, let's talk about it. I think as I look back, we knew our students much, much better. We also knew our employers much better because the, the main way they, they dealt with us was over the phone. Once their, their schedules and their notices had been prepared, there was no fax. And um, there were only three lines to get into our office. And so employers would spend, you know, it was funny. Many of them would joke about, well, I've been trying to get you for several days, but that doesn't bother me. I got you. <laughs> um, there was much more planning ahead. Uh, there was much more buy-in. An employer really had to plan far ahead to get a schedule to fly. And, and the employer's uh, purpose in building the schedule was not to visit West Lafayette. The purpose was to see as many well-qualified students as, as he or she could. And um, so it was very important to them. This, this was money. It was very important to them to make sure they had the right majors, and in those days, um, the right degree level. But in those days, they weren't concerned about too many other variables. Um, it was also crucial that our staff be exact. If by chance in some of the processes, an employer said, I want to see civil engineers, and the staff member wrote down chemical, or the typist typed CHE instead of CE, or, you know, you can just imagine the room for error. And um, very frankly, our staff did a beautiful job with that. We prided ourselves on... Mm -hmm. On the accuracy. On accuracy and not having an employer come in who needed aeronauticals and was getting ag engineers. They were not happy if that happened. Um, but students used to line up in, in bad times when the economy was tight. They would line up the day before Schedules went out at 8 a.m. each morning for two weeks hence, and they knew which ones they wanted. And they would start to line up in Stewart Center at 4 o'clock the, the afternoon before, or even at noon sometimes. They would queue all the way. I remember one morning we opened up and the line was all the way down to Loeb. It was almost scary. <laughs> and um, they complained about it a lot. And the funny thing was, the first year we went on the computer, when there were no lines, those students complained because there weren't lines. Because they said, if I want to get, out, get over here at 4 p.m. in the afternoon and sit outside in the hall all night, that's, that's my choice. Um, I do think that for students it was beneficial. I know it was a tremendous waste of time. But they did see the competition. And when we went on the computer, students sat in their rooms and pulled up a schedule and signed on. They never saw the competition. Um, if they stood outside in that hallway and they were one of 14 or one of 28 or whatever that got on the schedule, they knew who else was competing for that schedule. Mm -hmm. That was motivation. It was also responsibility. Uh, we had far fewer no-shows, what we call in the business no-shows when we were lining up than we did when we went on the computer. A no-show is, is a person who just doesn't show up for an interview. Employers view that as a crucial dimension of a university. In, in our business, some universities have a tremendous no-show problem. And employers will, li will literally cut them from their schedules. Um, Students, on the other hand, often don't understand that part or they don't accept that part. And sometimes they do have an emergency, but sometimes they just sort of say, oh, well, I don't feel like going in. And so they don't. And the employer sits there, you know, with nothing literally to do. Um, but when we were on paper and pencil, if you stood outside in that hallway and spent 12 or 14 hours out there eating pizza and playing cards and maybe studying a little bit, you made every effort to be at that inter interview. And furthermore, you saw the other people that were waiting. So you really, I think, uh, students had much more buy-in then. They understood that things were tough or that, you know, what, whatever, and that they really had a responsibility. Uh, we ran more interviews 
on paper and pencil than we ever have on the computer. Part of that was because employers couldn't target as much. They weren't computerized either. And so, as I said earlier, they would ask for degree and major and very little beyond. Now, they will ask for all kinds of variables, which because of the computer system can be can put that in, yeah. in sync. And so, because of targeted inter interviewing uh, and because of um, employers not wanting to spend as much money on the front-end recruiting process, um, the numbers have gone down. We still will run in a good year about twenty to 25,000, but mm -hmm. we've never hit that yeah. 35 right. again. Um, Let me ask you this. What about, uh, did they have job fair? Did you have job fairs then? That, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, education is another thing I'd like to ask about the teacher uh -huh. placement. That was, was separate. Was yes, it, it was separate until, um, well, let's see, I want to say the 90s. I mean, let me do education in a minute. Um, <laughs> in my early career, most of what we call job fairs now were called career fairs. And the purpose was a little bit different. The purpose was to talk with students about careers and to come back not as a representative of Alcoa, for example, but as uh, a chemical engineer and talk to students about what the chemical engineering uh, profession was like. Um, there wasn't much conversation about job jobs. That changed um, probably in the 80s, and the table became tilted much more toward job function. I'm sorry we lost that career emphasis, because I think just as many students today need career role models and career um, information from outside of the university as needed it then. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but job fairs and career fairs have always been a big part of our function. I think at Purdue, because we had so many employers visiting campus anyway, they were relatively easy to start. Uh, industrial Roundtable is probably the, one of the biggest in the country. In it's the been oldest. going for a long time. Mm -hmm. It is not ours. It is the School of Engineering. We've always um, helped them any way we were asked to or, or could. Um, and from time to time build schedules for them during the career fair and that, or the job fair and that kind of thing. But that was really from an academic school. Uh, pharmacy days are the same way. Agriculture has a lot of management. See, I think they all do now mm -hmm. have a large job fair. Unfortunately, like a lot of models, that one's become kind of stuck. And I don't, I guess in my own mind, I question whether that model is really meeting the needs of a lot of students. And any student who's gone to a career fair probably can, can attest to the fact that they're just circuses. You know, people are giving away things, they've got cars, um, you take your resume, you stand in a long line, um, you meet someone who may or may not have any knowledge of your field. Um, you know, the I'm, focus has changed, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And, and they're big, huge. Right. events. I'm not sure that they serve as many students as maybe some others would, but um, I'm not in the business anymore, so I'm not going to worry about it too much, I guess. Yeah. Um, education had its own placement service, and in fact, education had a very different model of employment, and to a certain extent still does. They interview at a certain time, and that's usually in the spring, in May or June. Um, they do not interview through the year. The employers don't. Um, they used to rely a lot on written credentials, and every education major had to have a credential file, which educational placement kept. And these files were based of, on recommendations from professors, from uh, your supervising teacher when you were in student teaching, character references. Um, and these were kept for a lifetime of the teacher. So you can imagine the number of paper credential files and the need to keep those as up-to-date as the alum wished them to be kept. 
In the school? In the department. Department, okay. And just a tremendous responsibility. And, and very frankly, it, I don't think it ever happened, I'm sure it never happened here, but it wasn't unusual for some of these credential file situations to get into the courts because a university had failed to maintain its credential files and an alum had lost a job as a result or, um, oh, there's been all kinds of nuances. Mm -hmm. So there were, it was just a really big situation. Employers, um, principals, superintendents, et cetera, really held on to that. And I think even today there are some who still say, I want credentials. A number of universities, though, including Purdue, um, said we can't do it anymore. It, it is not cost effective. We're keeping a lot of so-called dead files. Uh, I would be one. I, my credentials when I finished my master's degree were filed over there. And I'm sure they existed until it was purged in 90-whatever. Right. And never, I never used them. So 90% of those files, my guess, were never used. But you didn't know which 90%. Right. There were all kinds of problems. So when the School of Education decided that they needed to be streamlined in, in some ways, um, Dick and, and uh, Jerry Crockover, who, who was acting on behalf of the dean, worked out an agreement where their staff at that time and their clerical staff um, moved to Stewart Center and we began to dovetail the operations. Um, the last five, six, seven years, I think it's just been as smooth as glass. The first couple of years were rough because they were very different fields. Um, employers aren't as interested in the paperwork as they are in the candidate. In educational employers used to be more interested in the paper than the candidate. And so those two had to, sure. to kind of flip-flop. We also absorbed in the, I think, early 80s, the pharmacy operation. Pharmacy had had a separate placement office. And in that placement office, retail pharmacists like OSCO would come in and interview students in groups. They would have 15 students and they would run per, kind of quasi-personal interviews in these groups. Um, that was at the same time that women were becoming more um, important in the pharmacy student body. And um, I think women particularly spoke out against that. They didn't like the personal interview setting in a group situation. And so the School of Pharmacy decided that they would try to dovetail. And that, that again, went very smoothly. That involved, however, convincing employers that they had a better situation if they staffed for one-on-one -on -one interviews rather than one on 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a change in dynamic. Sure. Um, I did want to go back a minute, though, to the, the women um, Okay. Women's movement real quickly, because that was, when I first started in the 70s, that was one of my major challenges. And um, I had no experience at that time with employers, but quite a bit with students. Um, it was amazing what employers were asking in interviews. Um, and as I became involved in the field and got to know some of the employers better, they would reflect um, on what they had asked in the past and just shake their heads and say, you know, I can't believe I was asking that stuff. Um, but when discrimination based on sex became uh, illegal, um, I think everyone tried to toe the mark. Employers were initially very reluctant to train, and so the first few years, again, were rough because sometimes you would get somebody um, who hadn't heard about this new law or who heard about it but didn't quite believe it was important. And it was usually male because they were the only ones that were out there. And um, they still, into the late 70s, would ask women questions uh, that were not appropriate. Luckily, during those years, we had a reputation with our women that if they were asked a question that they felt was, was not appropriate, they should come across and discuss it with one of us immediately. Our guarantee to them was that we would not say anything to the employer 
unless they okayed it. If the woman wanted to continue to seek employment with that company, we usually advise them not to say anything until later, frankly. Um, but if she said, hey, I don't care what happens to this company, you can, you can tell them right now, we would. We were advocates on behalf of our women. Um, I think uh, this is also true, not I think, but I know it was also true with plant trips. Typically after the on-campus interview, a student who was promising would be asked to continue then to the plant trip stage. And in the early days, many of our women were inappropriately treated at the plant trip stage. And they would come back to campus and come into our office and say, this is what happened. It wasn't unusual at all for Dick or I um, to pick up the telephone and call. And if the recruiter or the person in charge of the plant trip refused to discuss it with us, it wasn't unusual for us to call that manager. Um, and say, you know, this needs to be looked into pretty carefully. We don't expect this kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. um, we would, of course, make sure that the student was on firm ground and not just blowing smoke, so to speak. But very frankly, they usually 100% were. Sure. Um, employers were concerned about marriage and family. They were concerned about illness factors. They were concerned about the competition, whether the women could compete. And in those years, the women who were in engineering and in pharmacy and in some of the uh, demanding scientific disciplines were a little bit different women. They were pioneers. And that probably sounds a little hokey, but they were. They were determined that they were going to be what it was they had thought they wanted to be all their lives. And so they were a little more gutsy, if you will. Um, I think today I'm a woman. I think today our young women take all that for granted. Um, hopefully, being an old history major, I'll put in a pitch for history here. Hopefully at some point in their lives they'll realize how much some of those gals in the 70s and, and even in the 80s paved the way because careers certainly were not open. Schools were not open. Um, I, when I was in the dean of girls or dean of women's office, um, at Purdue, several of my um, fellow staff members and I did a research study over at Vet Medicine. Dean Stockton was the dean then, and uh, he wanted he wanted to find out if women could be veterinarians. I will attest to the fact that he had a faculty that didn't believe they could be, because I knew several of them personally through church, and I wasn't in just one argument. I was in several. <laughs> Women could not be veterinarians. There was no way. And of course, if you admitted women into the school to go into that kind of classroom situation, you were asking for trouble. So one of the things that Dean Stockton did was ask us to do some research on the few women that were in vet medicine and see how those women compared with some other test groups like women in engineering and uh, also how they compared to their male colleagues. And we did that. And um, that was not why the vet school started to admit more women. There were many trends that came together, but that was one. And of course today, it's more than 50%. And one of the guys that I used to argue with at church about whether women could be veterinarians or not, now will tell you openly that his best graduate students are women. And I'll, every once in a while I'll say, now remember, he said, oh, Carol, forget that. <laughs> I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> so I'll those were exciting days. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things I think about the field of placement that uh, led to the career services movement is that placement throughout the country was was kind of a crazy quilt. Um, universities like Purdue, you know, where you had high traffic, high student involvement, were pretty few and far between. Most schools, because of geography or because of a non-technical curriculum or because of um, attitude of the faculty, didn't have a lot of employer traffic. And so what they were relying on more and more 
was the the notion that we'll train our students how to find work and they can go out and find their own. And that's a perfectly fine model. Uh, in fact, that's what my undergraduate university did until probably the last 20 years. They, they taught us how to seek work and we did our own job search. Placement, the word placement was always kind of a misnomer. Dick Stewart always used to say to every uh, orientation group, the only person I've ever placed is myself. I'm not going to place you. You will place yourselves. We'll just give you the, the opportunity and the forum and the chance to compare a lot of different opportunities. Um, so in the mid-80s, placement began to be referred to in our business as the P word. Purdue didn't change its name for a long time. And part of that is because of the Purdue system. Uh, career services is not, was not centralized here. A lot of universities have a central unit called a career services and counseling unit. Here, career services or career counseling was mainly in the dean's office, but could also be found in all the academic schools. And we did a little bit of it. Um, not much. We, we were too busy with the employment piece, but um, it was a very decentralized kind of situation. And there had been talk for several years about trying to pull it together and where it would best be pulled. Um, so eventually that became sort of the goal. And one of the first things that needed to be done was a name change. So University Placement Service. Well, the staff came up with a name. I can't remember now what it was, frankly. We spent a lot of time trying to think of a name for this. You usually name. do when it comes down to names. Right. To get some consensus of sorts. Yes. And we had our vice president's buy-in. It was not Dr. Robinson, but his predecessor. And so it went up the chain. And when it got up to Dr. Beering and um, Dr. Ringel, they didn't like it. So the president and the provost spent three days, according to them, coming up with another name. And that was Career Ser Services Center, um, or Center for Career Opportunities. Um, so we, we did that. I mean, it didn't say everything we wanted it to say, but it, okay. so that was it. Um, when Dick retired and left Purdue. I was the interim director for a few years and then we had a national search and Tim Luzader was hired. And one of the first things that happened after Tim was hired was that the person who was involved with career counseling, the main person who was involved with career counseling in the dean's office came over and became a part of our operation. And so that really um, began to change more the content of our office into one-on-one -on -one counseling. And in fact, when I took partial retirement and I was half time, um, most of my time was spent counseling students one-on-one -on -one rather than working with employers. Mm -hmm. So it really changed the focus of um, what most staff are doing. We still run a very visible employment situation, but certainly the counseling part is much more crucial. And in a way, I think that's, that's good. I wish the staff had increased a little more when all that happened. I wish Purdue could embrace a much larger career counseling mission. I think we kid ourselves at Purdue that students really do know what they want when they come here as freshmen and they go into a school and by gosh they better stay there because it's so hard to see ODO anywhere else. Um, I think a lot of our students aren't sure and they they do need um, some objective help, not attached to an academic school where there may be a stake in what they do, but some, uh, some objective help saying, okay, this is what you're interested in. A lot of people will say, interests aren't everything, but I guess at this end of my career, I'm going to say, interest is one heck of a lot of it. And after 34 years in placement and career services, I got to say, if I hadn't been happy to get out of bed every morning, I probably wouldn't be as happy as I am now. <laughs> Good point. The, the um, 
uh, most of the com what about the mid-size and small companies? Has that changed over time? Where they seem to be coming more than just the larger corporations, or is there a well, I think the small companies, um, which we define as based on number of employees, sure. not not um, profit, because profit-wise they may be huge. But a small company has a problem when they're looking at new college grads, even though most college grads now have internships. Um, in most small companies, as a professional, you have to do a wide, broad piece of the action and be ready to hit the ground running. Uh, they don't have training programs. They don't have a lot of workshops. They don't have retreats, you know, like some of the biggies do. And I think most small companies feel that their employment needs are better served by trying to source someone through who's experienced who's maybe worked five or six years for a larger company and wants to go into the smaller field, who is already trained and already sure. uh, ready to go. Ready to move. Yeah. So I frankly don't see the new college grad in big numbers ever being a good fit for a smaller firm. Now, I know there are exceptions to that. Oh, sure. But, but just in a general right, framework. Right. But in the majority of cases, I don't think they'll ever be a big customer on campus. They certainly are more than welcome to easily um, list a job with us and um, let people know that they're looking and what they're looking for, sure. and they'll get contacts that way. The middle-sized firm is kind of iffy. It depends on how many uh, college graduates they really need. A lot of medium-sized firms uh, are medium size because the upper echelon is still relatively small, but the production group, whatever the business they're in, the production group has grown, and sometimes that doesn't involve a degree. Um, I think if it does involve a degree, then yeah, they're in there competing. And the middle size firm has a lot to offer many graduates. Many graduates don't want to go into the humongous situation. Um, yeah. The IBMs of the world just, well, IBM isn't so big anymore either. Uh, that's another thing, the employer profile and the, the people who were the players in the 70s versus players today are so different, so different. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk lately in the presidential uh, campaign about being a service economy and, and mm -hmm. manufacturing has disappeared. And gosh, yes, that happened years ago. Um, we knew years ago that the General Motors and the IBMs weren't going to be here with 130 recruiters and all this. Um, but the medium-sized firm often doesn't have a lot of job openings that really need the degree. So they're sometime users. The thing about um, a placement service or a career services office in a school like Purdue is, you know, anyone can use it at any time. The only thing that we insist upon and do check is that they are completely above board in their hiring practices. They do not discriminate. Um, they are fair with their hires. Um, hiring in the impl imp private sector is not contractual. So that doesn't mean that if they make a job offer to you today and want you to start September 1st and their business falls apart in the meantime, it's legal for them to withdraw that offer. But in most cases, employers will, will compensate for withdrawing that offer. They will pay for a master's or they will um, help that person you know, find sure. other work or whatever. Um, but we insist that our employers be very ethical with our students. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that through the years we have not tolerated at Purdue. Um, and, and there's some funny stories about that. Um, I think one of the funniest was several years ago when I was the interim director, we had a company on campus from Indianapolis that was a new company. And um, they were to have a group meeting the night before and then they were to start their interviews at 8.30 in the undergraduate library. And they hadn't checked in by 8.30. 
So we went down to see if they were in the library, and there was no one there. So about 9 o'clock, their first interview came up and said, well, they never did come in. We couldn't find this company. They had been to their group meeting the night before, but it wasn't too long until one student came in and said, you know, their group meeting last night was at Harry's. Well, drinking in relation to recruiting is unprofessional. It's not illegal. It's unprofessional. And she said, I didn't stay because I don't like to drink when I'm in an interview. And I said, well, that makes sense, you know. So we kind of put two and two together and decided that maybe they were holding their interviews somewhere besides the undergraduate library. There weren't too many people available at that time to run around checking out spots. But one of the students had said, well, you know, I'm sure they're down in the village somewhere. So one of our staff did volunteer to go down to the village and she put on her trench coat and she trudged down there and she found him and Jake's just as they were leaving. Um, she didn't say anything to them. But they had students with them and there were empty pictures on the table and even though this, well it's Shirley Marciniak, even though Shirley doesn't drink and wouldn't know iced tea from beer, she was pretty sure there were beer pictures. So a couple of days later I called the young man and he was young, that doesn't have anything to do with it, but he was a young man. And I called him and I said, how was your interviewing trip to Purdue? I'd just like to follow up and see how that was. And he said, oh, it was a blast. And I went into my mode about, you know, this is not the kind of situation we want for our students. This is an unprofessional kind of way to present yourselves. And um, talk very seriously about he and I getting together, A, or B, them not coming back. And he did come in and we talked and we reached some agreements. But that kind of situation has no business in uh, entry-level employment on a college campus. A recruiter should know that. So, you know, one of the things that, one of the biggest roles we always had was advocating for students. I'm not sure that we were always seen that way. One of the things that we always did was if a recruiter in their targeting process did want people who were B's or better, students often saw us as being the people that somehow came up with that rather than the employer. We never enforced that. We did talk with students about if that's what the employer thinks they want, they're probably going to stick to it. If you're close and you think you have some sure. evidence, you know. There might be an option. Right. Um, but I think often students, as students will, I was one too, for a long time, <laughs> by the time I got my PhD, um, students saw us maybe as being on the employer's side, which nothing could have been further than the truth. Um, I'm real proud of the operation at Purdue, the 34 years I was involved with it, real proud of the history before I got there and real proud of what's happening since. I think it's a strong operation, um, definitely uh, strong in terms of launching, helping to launch students into very promising careers. Um, of course, any career is only what the person puts into it, but the ability to see a lot of different um, employers, future employers in one place and to compare them at Purdue rather than going to 14 different sites around the country, you know. That's, that's quite a privilege that's for right. our students. Right, All right. So, yeah. what uh, we've been doing since retirement, what, why, did anything well, special? I, yes, I built a house, which I swore I would never do. I didn't actually build it, but I had it built. That, the word was, I built the house, I picked up on that. Okay, I know. yeah. I, um, decided that I needed something on one floor. So I built a house out on uh, 26 West, closer to Purdue than I ever lived when I was working here. Whereabouts did you live when you were working here, further out? Or? Well, for a while I lived um, up at Lake Freeman. Oh, okay. So I had about 20, 25 sure. miles each way. And then I moved to Indian Trail, which is not that far. It's over on the west side. Um, but at any rate, I, I moved into the house in August after I graduate, or graduated, retired in April. 
and um, I have had quite a bit of family involvement with aunts and uncles who've been ill, who are elderly. Um, but this year, I have tackled something new, which, as my friends said, why did you do, what were you thinking when you did this? Um, I volunteered to be a, a tax preparer at LUM. And in order to do that, you have to be certified by the IRS. So you take this, you know, you have manuals up to here, and you take this exam, and um, you get a certificate from Internal Revenue Service saying that you're now a qualified or certified volunteer tax preparer at the basic level. I'm just basic. I can't do military. I can't do foreign national or anything like that. It is hard. And prior to getting involved in studying for this thing, I had heard um, Governor Huckabee's idea about doing away with the IRS, which I thought was kind of funny at the time. I'm beginning to think he might be right. It is complicated. And we're talking here about the very basic below 39000 a year with kids kind of profile. They're the ones that qualified f for free preparation. It is so complex. And one of the most mystifying things to me are the double negatives um, throughout the document. You know, as of June 07, was this person unmarried? Well, why don't you say, was this person single? Or was this person, I don't know. Why do you have to say, I bet. I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, <laughs> but that's my big thing right now. Um, I, I'm very interested in dogs. I have three of my own, and I like to do dog shows and things like that. I don't show, but I like to, to What attend. kind of dogs do you have? Well, I have Italian greyhounds. Oh. And they're the little, they weigh about 12, 15 pounds, and they look just like a large greyhound, but they're very small. Large greyhounds are very calm and loving, and they're really couch potatoes unless they're out walking sure. or running. The little guys are not couch potatoes. They are constant motion, constant um, challenge, keep me on my feet. Um, and I have three, and they're, they're all girls, so that's another little problem. <laughs> <laughs> that, and, that keeps you on your toes for want of a better right, you know, thing. Right. So those are some of the things I'm involved Good. in. Are you still active in the professional association? Um, somewhat. The, I, the last conference I was at was in uh, 05 when I actually retired. Uh -huh. um, we do meet once a year, and I think I'm going to try to get to, to the one next fall, although right at the moment I can't remember where it is. I've been doing a lot of traveling. Uh, but with the dollar exchange right now, <laughs> keeping a low profile. <laughs> um, but yeah, the professional association was a big part of my life. I was involved at the regional level and went through all of the um, offices. And then at the national level, I was on the board. I think that I think the professional organizations for many of us in the university are training grounds. Um, very few people at Purdue know as much about the libraries as, as your professional organizations know about libraries. Well, same true with us. Mm -hmm. And so in meeting with uh, other career services people and employers, employers are a part of our organization. The National is called National Association for College Employers. And um, so in meeting with uh, college, other college people, and place or um, recruiting people from all over the country. It it really was a great, great training ground and a great network. Mm -hmm. um, there were many times during my career when I was in a position to call somebody that I knew through NACE um, to get information to help a student I was counseling, or even to set up a mock interview with a student that was so nervous about interviewing that just doing mock interviews with me wasn't working. They needed, you know, somebody else right? who was yeah. real. Um, so that whole professional involvement was just crucial. And, and Dick was very, very aware and consistent about keeping his staff involved in professional groups, and so is Tim. Mm -hmm. 
they both realize that that's very, very important right. yeah. for the professional. Right. You were the president of the Midwest College Placement Service mm -hmm. at one time, and then you got that J.W. Pickett Award for right. Superior Literature, which is nice. Right. Yeah. The, the J.W. Paquette Award was to recognize people in the field at the current time who had contributed a lot. In other words, a, lo a lot of our awards were at retirement, and the board, well, I think back in the 80s sometime, decided that by the time the person gets close to retirement, there's a lot of people in the organization that maybe don't know them, and many, maybe a lot of their friends have gone on. So the Paquette Award was designed to, to recognize you while you were still active. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, I think. Yeah. yeah. Right. Interesting thing about him, he started out at Purdue as a professor of communication. And then he went to, um, well, I don't think I can say the name of the school. It's a small school in Iowa, a private school in Iowa and was the uh, emplacement there for several years. And then he went to the University of Illinois and he retired from there as the Director of Commerce Placement. So Bill Paquette was very active in our field for many years, great guy. When I did retire, um, then I got the awards and I remember looking out at the audience and thinking, there nobody, I don't know anybody, it's a whole new group. You know? But, um, uh, got the honorary membership, lifetime membership. So I can go back to the conferences at any time. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. What about, uh, how about a favorite memory of Purdue? You got one or, and also an outstanding event. You can take both or whichever you'd feel. You got okay. something comes to mind. Well, I have a lot of favorite memories. Um, people who know me well know that I always remember the fun things. And I don't know if this will suffer in the telling or not, but one of my f most favorite memories was just a funny situation. Um, Dick, you know, com Purdue was on the mainframe computer for years. And meanwhile, a lot of employers in the 80s were using computers and were pushing college placement offices to use computers. and. Um, Purdue was not interested, especially in an office like ours using computers. On the other hand, a lot of employers that came through us um, had programs where they would award product to an office like ours. And so um, companies would give us computers and we would put them through the Purdue catalog process, you know, so we had all the tools. And through one of these professional associations, um, Purdue and several other schools and several of the big employers like P&G and IBM got together in a coalition <clears throat> and began to niche away at computerizing placement. So Dick really drove a lot of that, nationally as well as here. And um, one, of the, one of my fun, most fun memories was um, Somebody had given us a video conferencing capability, and he was like a kid with a new bicycle. I mean, he just was so excited about this. And it was way back in the interviewing suite, one of those little bitty niche things. And um, the idea was that you talk to somebody else somewhere, some distance away, who had um, a video capability. So this other person, some distance away, was the director of placement at the University of Tennessee, Bob Greenberg, who was also a big mover and shaker in computers. So they had this assigned time and they were going to talk to each other, see each other on this thing. It all sounds so simple now, but in those days it was a no, mystery. No. So there were interviews going on in the rest of the rooms, but he had reserved that room for this video conferencing capability. So I happened to go over there to talk to one of the employers and I heard him saying from the front of the suite, can you hear me now? And it sounds like one of the commercials that we have on TV now. Bob, can you hear me? And I couldn't hear Bob saying anything. So I went back to, I think it was room 19 way in the back, and Dick was down on his hands and knees under the computer table 
trying to adjust something so that they get, get some noise, some sound. And Bob was up on the screen trying to make hand motions <laughs> in sign language to talk to Dick. Finally, I don't know how it finally happened, but finally he found some button he hadn't pushed, and he pushed that button just as Bob said, Can you hear me? <laughs> and everybody in the suite popped their doors open or looking out. You know. It, I just about, that is it, was yeah. it was fun. It was fun. And knowing how much joy it brought to those two guys because they were really Pioneers techies. from that. <laughs> techies. They didn't know what they were doing, but they loved technology. Mm -hmm. um, Purdue itself was just awfully good to me. I, I enjoyed Purdue a lot. Um, very different than any other, you know, I went to a small university. Um, taught in a big high school, but high school organizations are different. I, I enjoyed Purdue. There are many things about Purdue I wish could change, um, but by and large, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And I can't think of one thing that sticks in my mind. Um, you know, there are many ways that it recognized me, I think, and I appreciate those things, but I did just I enjoyed the students a lot. I enjoyed the curriculum a lot, the faculty. It was all good. Yeah, yeah. very good. Thank yeah. you, Carol. We appreciate that. You're very this concludes welcome. the interview with Carol Barrett. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>